here's, here's the sugar cane fields here, and here's Florida Bay down here. Red is phosphorus, blue is nitrogen. So red here, is, this is the high phosphorus coming out of the sugar cane fields. That's what led the uh, federal government to sue the state of Florida and the South Florida Water Management District in 1980 for allowing the sugar cane farms to pollute the Everglades. Okay? And that's basically this phosphorus here going into the Everglades here. But notice that phosphorus never makes it all the way to Florida Bay because the Everglades are phosphorus limited. Eventually you run out of that phosphorus, you deplete it all, and it never makes it all the way to Florida Bay. So it's a problem in the Everglades itself, but not further downstream in Florida Bay. But now look at nitrogen. Now what I've done, I've adjusted the scales of these two differently such that if the nitrogen and phosphorus in a, was in a 16 to 1 ratio, those two lines would be on top of each other. So what this tells you is there's a huge excess of nitrogen. And in fact, the nitrogen and phosphorus ratio is more like 100 to 200 to 1. It's a huge excess of nitrogen. So what happens is, sure, initially, as this water flows downstream from the sugarcane fields, just as the plants are taken in the line, or the plants are taking up the phosphorus, they're also taking up the nitrogen. But once the plants run out of phosphorus, or are now phosphorus limited, all that excess nitrogen, the plants can't use it. So most of the rest of the nitrogen just flows right on downstream all the way into Florida Bay. That's why you see that high nitrogen over there in eastern Florida Bay. Now that phosphorus is fertilizer. You might initially think, well, that nitrogen is fertilizer too. But think about it. If plants need nitrogen and phosphorus in 16 to 1 ratio, would those farmers be adding a fertilizer of 100 to 1, 200 to 1? That makes no sense at all, because you can clearly see most of that is running off all the way down into Florida Bay. Turns out that's not fertilizer. That's in fact why the sugarcane farmers love that soil up there. They don't have to spend any money on nitrogen fertilizer. It's already rich in nitrogen. The reason for that, you have to look at the history of everybody. Basically, you think of Florida as being very flat, but it's not completely flat because of some other geological events, which I won't go into. You've got a ridge called the Atlantic Coastal Ridge right along here, and a ridge here called Lake Wales Ridge, and then a trough in the middle. So that's what sets up our watershed on the eastern side of Florida here. Instead of the water going east and west, it gets channeled between these two ridges through the Kissimmee River Basin, through Lake Okeechobee, the Everglades, down into Florida Bay. So look at it from the side, you've got a, a ridge here, a ridge here, and a trough here. So coming out of the last ice age, as sea level rises and Florida becomes more humid, more rainfall and so on, you start filling up this trough with water. And that's how you set up a wetland. So the Everglades is a wetland, you just fill up that trough, and over time, the Everglades is about 5,000 years old, over time, all the organic material from the plants go down in the water, go anaerobic, and you build up what we call an organic peat. And organic peat is extremely rich. These wetlands are very good at storing up nutrients. So this organic peat is extremely rich in nitrogen. Okay? And as long as it's underwater, as a wetland, it just slowly traps more and more of that, particularly the nitrogen. Okay? That's why wetlands are really good at uh, cleaning up the water, because they tend to suck up the nutrients and store them there. The problem is if you humans come along and now drain the wetland, that's of course what's happened to the northern third of Africa, is we've drained it. Now what happens? You drain the organic peat, you expose it to the air, and now bacteria attack that organic peat and decompose it. Basically turn that organic matter into CO2 up in the air, and you release that nitrogen. And this lead, okay, well here just shows, before you drained it, you head up to uh, 15 feet or more of organic peat in that trough. Now by draining it, you've destroyed much of them, and this leads to subsidence. In other words, this post here, that was the surface of the soil in the Everglades in 1927. Wow. By 2012, that's the surface. You've lost all that soil, all that organic peat, and all that nitrogen just ran downstream. Okay, so that's the source of the nitrogen. Here's another example. Here's a house that was built in the Everglades in 1930. That was the surface of soil in 1930. And all that soil has disappeared underneath it because it's drained. So every few years they have to build another step here to get up to their front door. 
Okay, so let's look at the history of sugarcane acreage in the northern third of the Everglades now that it's drained. And you can see it just sort of putters along until 1959 and then starts shooting up. So what happened in 1959? That's, a, that's the Cuban Revolution. It's the middle of the Cold War. Uh, U.S. government's not happy with a communist dictator only 100 miles to the south. So they proceeded to try to get rid of Fidel Castro. The bad pigs didn't work out too well. The exploding cigars didn't work, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So uh, they decided to try to destroy the Cuban economy, which at that time was primarily sugarcane. So a complex series of tariffs, uh, subsidies, etc., price supports, and so on, basically subsidized sugarcane industry in South Florida. So that's you see this huge increase, about tenfold increase. Okay, and of course. For the past 50, 60 years, it was so successful getting rid of Fidel Castro, we continued to subsidize the sugar industry to the a high calculate between two to five billion dollars a year. Okay, we're back up. But the problem here, you see the huge drainage in the 1960s, but the algal blooms in Florida Bay didn't start until the 1980s. What happened? Well, because to keep this land dry, to keep these sugarcane fields dry, you've got to pump out the water, just like the Netherlands. Well, what the Army Corps of Engineers did to come in, and they reversed the flow of water in South Florida. They installed giant pumps, and there's naturally the water flows south. Well, they put giant pumps up here, and they back pumped the water into Lake Okeechobee. And then down the Clusage River, the Army Corps of Engineers greatly enlarged the Clusatch River as well as the St. Lucie Canal. So you dump all this water down the Clusatch and St. Lucie rather than sending it south. I'll show you data at this, space, this location here, halfway between the sugarcane fields and uh, Florida Bay. And you can see here, in the 60s and 70s, very little water is heading south. I mean, you have hurricanes and so on, basically very little water is going south. So, you dump all this nutrient water in Lake Okeechobee, so surprise, surprise, you start getting huge algal blooms in Lake Okeechobee, then fish kills, and then lawsuits. So right around 1980, lawsuits forced them to stop that back topping, or at least greatly reduce it. They still back pump a little bit, no, we're near as much as they did. So now what happens, right around 1981, 82, that's when you see this huge increase of water heading south. By 1987, you see that phosphorus polluting the Everglades, which led to the, the uh, federal lawsuit. This is actual data for how much water is going in to Florida Bay. And again, you see this increase right around 1981-82. It's a drought here, and then even higher levels in the 90s, and so on. So you reverse the flow of water again, turning, sending that water south. And that's exactly when we see the algal blooms in Florida Bay. Now we don't have data back then, but the fishermen are out there every day. So Karen D. Maria interviewed a lot of the fishermen, and they say from 1981 the water started getting cloudy, and have a hard time seeing the bottom. Okay, water got dirtier, blooms grew, and the seagrass started dying, and so on. So it's very clear the blooms started developing in 1981, and then in 1987 we had this massive seagrass dying. I'll come back to that in a second. Okay, what we'll look at here, this is uh, salinity, how salty the water is. This is during that drought of 89.90. So the blue indicates high salinity. So there's very little fresh water getting into the bay during that drought. Now we come out of the drought in the 90s, pump a lot of fresh water, and that's what the orange is, all this fresh water coming in from the northern Everglades down into the Florida Bay. Okay, now these two lower slides is nitrogen. So during the drought, when there's very little fresh water, there's very little nitrogen coming into the bay. Now you come out of the drought, you pump all this water into the bay, you pump all that nitrogen in. And of course, that nitrogen comes into the bay, it's gonna mix, mix with that phosphorus over here to the west, and you're gonna generate that bloom right there in the middle. That's exactly what we saw starting around 1981-82. So I'm gonna take data at these four stations here, Here's 15 years worth of data. Blue is amount of water going into the bay. So you see the, the traditional uh, wet season, dry season cycle. 
15 years of cycling, and the ingredient is the size of the algal blooms. And you can see it goes up and down the same way. You get the blooms in the wet season when you have all that water going in. We just take monthly averages. Okay. Blue is amount of water going into the bay. So here we start from January through December. So here's our dry season, our wet season, and so on. And then green is the size of the algal blooms. So you can see a little bit of a delay it takes for the algae to grow, but you can see a very good correlation. That is the total algae. This is specifically blue-green algae. So it turns out that bloom is almost all blue-green algae. Okay? That's seasonality. But you also have long-term changes because of El Nino and other long-term uh, climatic shifts. You have wet years and dry years. So we're now taking annual averages. So here's some wet years, here's some dry years. And you see the same thing. Well, so I was showing the connection between sugarcane farms and the algal blooms of Florida Bay that made quite a few people unhappy. So some people were paid to, uh, to come up with an alternative view. And sure enough, they said, we don't see any correlation whatsoever between algal blooms and runoff of this nitrogen-rich water from the sugarcane farms down into Florida Bay. Now what's interesting, we both use the same data set. So how can this be? Well, because neither of us use the, com the complete data set. The data set has data throughout all these stations here. Remember, I took the data at these four stations here in red. These other folks took the data just in the stations in blue. In other words, I took the data where the blooms occur. They carefully selected out the stations where there's no algal blooms and concluded there's no correlation between algal blooms and your freshwater runoff. But you have to read the paper very carefully. You know, the abstract the paper just says no correlation. You got to look at the fine print and the methods they use. And you see this all the time. When money gets involved, there's a lot of dishonest people which will, they don't maybe outright lie, but they do a lot of incredibly misleading things. You have to be very careful. Uh, Joe Boyer and, uh, and Ron Jones. Okay, uh, this also contradicts what's now a $15 billion plan called the Comprehensive Everglades Restoration Plan. It was already stimulated by two things. First of all, the federal lawsuit about the pollution of the Everglades, but secondarily, the massive seagrass style down in the algal blooms in Florida Bay. Now I'm going to focus on the Florida Bay part of this. This is the hypothesis. Okay, You have reduced fresh water into Florida Bay. Well, we know that because a lot of that water is now diverted down the Cusatch River and the St. Lucie. Less fresh water means you get higher salinity water, what we call hypersalinity. The bay gets too salty. Seagrasses can't tolerate it. And so the seagrasses die, and they died in 1987. Seagrasses die, they decompose, release nutrients, nitrogen and phosphorus, and those nutrients generate algal blooms. Perfectly plausible. Okay? Now, I initially accepted that hypothesis until I started looking at the data. Then we start seeing some problems. Okay, first of all, the seagrass die off is this area over here and all these red areas here. Natural salinity of seawater drying, 37 parts per thousand. Well, yeah, you have some high salinity here, like 50 here. But your largest seagrass dolphin here and over here and over here is in normal seawater. Okay, so you, that high salinity cannot explain the seagrass dolphin. Plus, we know that you, seagrass can even tolerate 50. They can, you can find them in parts of the world living up to 70 parts per thousand. I'll come back to that in a second. Furthermore, the seagrass die-off was in 1987, and it was after many years of increased freshwater flow, not decreased. Okay. And you look at the, go through the history, back in the 50s, the bay got to 60, 70 parts per thousand. Much higher than today, you had no seagrass die-off. Now, the seagrass don't like that high salinity, but they can tolerate it. It's actually, Around here in 87, that you get this, you look at all these numbers, it's the lowest down here when they start dumping all that fresh water in. 
So the Sea-Rise Dolphin was actually at the time of increased freshwater flow in the bay, not decreased. Exactly backwards. So that part of the hypothesis. You can't explain, you can't explain uh, spatially or temporally the seagrass dolphin. In fact, the hypothesis is backwards. Okay, what about the seagrass dolphin generate nutrients and algal worms? Well, when seagrasses die off, they're going to release nutrients, but the nutrients are going to end up in the same place. You can't have phosphorus molecules swimming to the west and nitrogen molecules swimming to the east. You cannot explain the die off, that, I'm sorry, that spatial pattern of nitrogen phosphorus from a die off. Especially when you consider the largest die-off is over here. Okay? Furthermore, the rest of this time of water in Florida Bay is like a, about a year or so. Here it is 30, 40 years later. You still see the same spatial pattern, the same high nutrients in the bay. Those nutrients should have been flushed out 30, 40 years ago. Okay? There's no way a seagrass dolphin can explain that nutrient pattern. And again, as I mentioned earlier, Fishman saw the bloom still sort of developing in 1981, and the cigarettes dial came off later in 1987. And that's what we see everywhere else in the world. You get nutrients going into the embayment, leads to algal blooms overgrowing the cigarettes and killing the cigarettes off, not the reverse. Okay, I'll just skip that. Basically, it says but you start to see a mackerel of seaweeds just covering the bottom, killing off the seagrasses. Uh, so again, virtually every aspect of this $15 billion hypothesis is wrong, and not only wrong, for most part, backwards. So right now they're spending $15 billion to try to dump more of this nutrient-rich water, or this nitrogen-rich water from the sugarcane farms down into Florida Bay. The idea, they claim that they're going to get rid of the algal blooms, I argue, they're going to make it much worse. Okay, now let's move upstream, let's go up. Initially, the Coosahatchee River was not connected to the lake at all. Okay, but again, in order to drain the Everglades, they, there was no connection to the East Coast at all, and so they cut the uh, St. Lucie Canal to the East Coast, to the Indian River Lagoon, and then they made a connection here to the Coosahatchee River, and then greatly enlarged it in 1960, so that you could dump all this water down the Coosahatchee River as well. And this just indicates abundance of blue-green algae. You get high abundance, here's the Lake Okeechobee, you get high abundance of blue-green algae on average all the way down the entire length of the Kudich River down to the west coast. Here's a picture, that's the S79 dam. You can see the bloom on behind the dam there. Every time I take a cruise along the west coast, I always see higher abundance of algae near the mouth of the Kudich River there. Telling me it's a major source of nutrients to the west coast. Here I'm looking at Estero Bay, Pine Island Sound, and then Clusage Estuary. This is during the dry season when there's very little river flow, and this is during the wet season when you have a lot of river flow, all this nitrogen water coming down the river. So obviously, much higher abundance of algae during the wet season. Here's five years worth of data in Charlotte Harbor. Okay. So blue is river flow, so you get the wet season, dry season, wet season, and so on. And then green is the size of the algal blooms in Charlotte Harbor. Pretty good correlation. Pine Island Sound, five years worth of data. Estero Bay, same thing. Now, so far I've just talked about algae in general. Now I want to talk about one particular species. And that's this one here. And you probably recognize this is Crenia brevis. This is the dinoflagellate that produces the red tide on the west coast. And of course, the problem is it produces this toxin here called brevitoxin. It's a neurotoxin. And as you already know, it kills lots of fish. There's a harbor filled with dead, rotting fish, manatees, dolphins, sea turtles, and so on. If you take 50 years worth of data, you just sort of average it out, and there's where does it tend to occur? Now, at any given time, it doesn't look like this, but on average, where are you most likely to get the red tide? This is the hot spot inshore from about Tampa Bay down to Naples. Okay? Why is that? Well, we think, now you can find red tide on occasion off the Texas coast, 
off the Yucatan and so on, and other parts of the Gulf of Mexico, but the big hot spot where you most likely get it and the highest density zone is right here. Okay, so why is that? Well, first of all, probably because of sponsor environments. Remember, the continental shelf extends way out here. Undoubtedly, we don't have the data, but almost certainly those fossil deposits extend right on out onto the shelf. So you already have the phosphorus. Now all you need is the nitrogen. Okay. Furthermore, it's a very shallow shelf. Okay. You can go 100 miles out and it's still shallow enough. You can get light to the bottom. And for we're pretty sure it's got a life cycle that spends part of its life cycle in surface waters and parts on the bottom. It can sit there on the bottom getting nutrients and still get light to swim back up to the turf because this algae swims. Okay? So it's got a very large habitat to live in over here. This very broad, shallow shelf here. And indeed, what we found, this is a cyst that was shown to be produced by the algae in a culture back in 1982. And here's a cyst we found in the settlements. We found a bunch of these cysts on the West Florida shelf. So we're pretty sure that is the same as this one here. Uh, so we're pretty sure that's part of the life cycle. It sits in that sea cysts, like seeds in the bottom sediments, and on occasion they suddenly germinate and swim up to the surface. And again, you have a huge area there with the West Florida shelf where these cysts or seeds can sit. Very important part, I'm pretty sure, is very important here, is talk about algal blooms. Now, people naturally think, oh, bloom means these algae are growing very rapidly. Turns out that's not the case. Most of the ones that form the toxins, most of the ones that form these blooms, are slow growers. The red tide can only divide maybe twice a week. It's among the slowest growing of all the algae. Okay? Which means if that water is mixing a lot, you're never going to be able to get a high density because it's always going to get mixed away. You've got to have reduced mixing so the algae can grow faster than mixing. Okay? So we're looking at here is tidal data. And what you see down here and up here, you see pretty large tidal mixing. And right here, you see minimum tidal mixing. This is called the tidal node. And that's right there where the hot spot is. It's where you have reduced tidal mixing. That's what allows you, by having reduced mix, that allows you to develop a high density of these slow growing algae. So the physical astronomy is very important. I'm just skip that. Can you tell us what town that is? Excuse me? Can you tell us what town that is? What? The hot spot. The hot spot around the What towns? Yeah. Oh, from, uh, from about uh, both Sarasota or, or Tampa down to Naples. The hot spot is Sarasota. Yeah, Sarasota. Right, exactly. You're the hot Sarasota is right in the center of it. Mm -hmm. uh, if you take surface drifters and release them out here, you'll see they never go inshore here. There's something called a, there's like a boundary here, okay? Transport boundary. So, so the inshore waters can't get offshore and the offshore waters can't get inshore. It's because of peculiar physical oceanography, the mixing of the water there. That basically means that when you dump a lot of nutrient water in here, it's not going to get mixed away. It stays, it gets bottled up in here. And same thing with bloom. You start developing a bloom, it's not going to get mixed away. It's not going to get mixed away, dispersed out in the open ocean. So basically by bottling it up here, it allows you to slowly develop a large bloom. So again, I think that's why this is a hot spot. Uh, and well this is a colleague of mine, also in Alice she's using a certain type of physiological or logical coherent structures to she prove why that is a boundary there. I won't go into the details. I'll skip that, all this. Uh, yeah, I'll skip. Well, I think, yeah, let me point this out. The, we really have a hard time, we still really can't predict exactly when and where red tide is going to develop. The one thing I feel pretty confident about <clears throat> is, of course, the physical astronomy, but we have something called loop current that comes from, through this uh, Yucatan Straits, and the current normally comes up like this, makes a big loop, and then goes back down like this, and then over to the East Coast as the Gulf Stream. And what we found is that every time, when you have the loop current in this position, 
but you have a good chance of getting a red tide. Not always, but you can get the red tide, and we can show from the physical astronomy, when you have a loop current in this position, it forms a very strong boundary here, trapping those intro orders in there. But then that loop current is constantly meandering, so when it's in the southern position, so that it comes along and instead of going, making a big loop up here, it just goes straight over into the Straits of Florida here, it basically disrupts that boundary, flushes the thing, and we never get a red tide when the loop current's in the southern position. That's the one thing we feel pretty confident about in terms of predicting the red tide. Now when the loop current's in the northern position, it still doesn't guarantee one, but you're more likely to have a red tide. Okay, so now, what I'm doing is taking the data, I'm going from the shoreline, going offshore. Okay, blue is salinity, so basically as you go inshore, you see less and less salty water. It's because of the freshwater runoff. Now on average, you get abundance of red tide, it's much more abundant inshore. Again, suggesting that the nutrients from that freshwater runoff might be increasing the abundance of the red tide. I've done the same thing here, transect from inshore to offshore, except the difference is, this is what it looked like 50 years ago, this is what it looks like now. In other words, on average, the red tide is now 15 times more abundant than it used to be. It's getting worse. Okay, and then you just take the area there, this is 50 years ago, the average abundance 50 years ago, and today. Just take the coastline, where people interact with the red tide most, right along the beaches, huge increase, Sarasota Bay, Lemon Bay, and so on. And you just calculate the maximum how dense these blooms can get. 50 years ago, it was like two and a half million cells per liter. Now it's more like 35 million cells per liter. To get 15 times more algae, you need 15 times more nutrients. And I can't think of any natural nutrient sources that have increased 15-fold over the last 50 years. What has dramatically increased in Florida over the last 50 years? Basically us. And all our activities, agriculture, sewage, etc. So uh, again, a lot of people were not happy with my conclusion, suggesting there might be a connection between uh, human activities and red tide. So the state hired some people to uh, try to counteract this. And they concluded that no. And then again, they use the exact same data set. And they concluded no, no connection, that the red tide has not increased at all over the last 50 years. But again, look at the fine print. Okay, you look at their methods. I used the raw data. They took the raw data and they converted it first. They converted anything less than 1,000 cells per, mil, per liter. It's called category one. 1,500, category two, etc. Anything over 100,000 cells per liter is called category four. Notice, and this was done, this was, they were told to do this by the state scientists at FWRI. Okay? What's FWRI? Uh, for a Wildlife Research Institute. They're right here, your, your, your neighbors. Okay, so category four is from anything over 100,000 cells per liter. In other words, we went from category four to category four. No increase in red tide. Okay. That's the kind of games that be played. Okay, okay, yeah. So initially, again, the Kosciak Fever was not connected to Lake Okeechobee. So the watershed of Lake Okeechobee initially was this blue area. But once you connect it to the lake, now it includes the back pump sugarcane fields to the south, as well as the entire Kissimmee River Basin. So the watershed's four times larger. On top of that, the original Everglades here were wetlands, they were a nutrient sink, and now it's a huge nutrient source. Much of the Kissimmee River, same thing. The Army Corps of came in and uh, drained much of the wetlands and channelized the river so that a lot of this could be used for dairy farms, cattle ranches, citrus, etc. So again, you've converted wetlands, which were nutrient sink, to agriculture as a nutrient source. So, not surprised, you've got a lot more nutrients coming down the Clusatch River now, as well as a lot more water. Okay, I'll just get that. Okay, uh, here's data taken by Gene Turner. 
This is a sediment core in Charlotte Harbor. By taking a sediment core, you can look at the history of nutrients because you can date the sediments and so on. So you can, you're looking at the record of nutrients from the year 1800 to the year 2000. So what you see in all these cases, a huge increase in the nutrients just in the last half of the 20th century, precisely when you see the huge influx of humans into South Florida. Same thing with algal abundance in those, uh, those settlements.